Namaste. Good morning. My name is Ram Kada, and uh, today I will speak about legacy of Mahatma Gandhi ji. As you know, this year would be his 150th birth year, celebrated all over the world. We are on the eve of that day, which is October 2. He was born in 1869. For 70 years, he's gone from this physical world, but his message of non-violence is ringing around the world. At United Nations, October 2 has declared Non-Violence Day. It has been celebrated all around the world. So. World has seen Gandhiji since 1930, known very well. And then, of course, his assassination in 1948. But he's honored by the Indians as father of the nation. Father of the nation who got the freedom from British without using a force, only using the force of non-violence or ahimsa and love. He did not hold any position in the government. He was not a prime minister. He was not a president. He was not a rich man. He was not a scientist. Who was he? He did not hold any wealth. When he left this world, only thing he had is the glasses and watch and, and the couple shoes. So, when he left, Albert Einstein said, the generation to come, I would rather read his uh, correct word, uh, then uh, talking from my memory. Generation to come sc scarce believe that such a one as this ever in flesh and blood walked upon this earth. And his last word was when bullet, assassin bullet hit him, his last words were, Hey Ram. Hey Ram is Hey God. He left with those words, God. But at the same time, his definition of God was truth. He said, Truth is God, God is truth. And all his struggle throughout his life was insistence on truth. And we will examine when we look at his life. But man, he's considered man of the century and some have said man of, man of the uh, future also. He fought the basic human rights, freedom, equality, and justice. Why his life and legacy is significant even today? Whatever he did 70 or 100 years ago still rings around the world for these three things. Basic freedom, equality and justice. Still the world is fighting for. So how did he fight? He fight for those things with ahimsa, non-violence and of course a translation is love. Also, he come out with a new word, word I had never seen that word called Satyagraha. Satya means truth, Agra means insistence. We know nonviolence is in all religions from centuries. But along with comes the Agra, the Satya, the second word comes the truth. So when the 
Non-violence is connected with the truth. And that's a Satyagraha. With Satyagraha, he experimented in South Africa. And with that Satyagraha, he got the freedom. Also, he got the right of Indians who were in South Africa. And he fought with the local British people or government for 20 years. And he prepared his countrymen over there in South Africa to have the Satyagraha, non-cooperation, non-obedience movement. And the same thing, so South Africa for Gandhi was a laboratory for his convictions, which he tried in India from all the way from 1915, when he returned from South Africa, until his death, 1948. So we look at some of the examination. So how this man, he was not a, he did not have any superpower. He was not intelligent. In a sense, he was not scholar. He was intelligent, but he was not, a, he was not an educational scholar, we can say, or he was not scientist or poet. But he, if you look at his life, he was born in a small city called Porbandar in Gujarat in 1869, October 2. And from the childhood, he was a very shy boy. He, and he did not have much attention in the school studies or math. But he worked very hard. He loved his parents so much. He loved his parents so much. Even with his deficiencies, he never told them lie. And most of the time, this characteristic or attribute he developed he stayed with him all life. All his struggles, the truth came first. As a, as a boy, he developed, he was so many weaknesses. He did not did not believe in himself in earlier years in the school. And he got the wrong companies. He even tried out stealing the money to satisfy the, the, the meat eating. Because the influence of the person was that if you eat meat, you can become a strong strength. And you need the strength to beat the British. So that kind of a thing in a child, you know, this develops every time. But he beat that out. He says, no, I cannot go on lying to my parents. What is he doing, everything? He did not quit because that thing was wrong. But he quit, cannot tell the lie to the parents or to take the money from the servant's pockets. He did not do that. Even though he married at very young age. That was a very common thing in India. Arranged marriages. And in his family, his parents, to save the money, had a three marriages together one time. His marriage, his brother's marriage, and his cousin's marriage. At age 13, he married 13-year-old girl, Kasturba, Kasturbai, at that time. And he writes in his diary or experiment a truth book. He did not understand the marriage, but he had fun wearing new clothes, eating sweets, and meeting a lot of people. That was the marriage day. That's what he liked. He was very jealous of his wife, Kasturbai. And in those days, wife, this young bride or wife, did not stay very long with the husband's home. They went back to the parents' home. Anyway. And she was <laughs> she was also illiterate. Kasturbai. <coughs> in those days, girls' education was not there much, very much. But she was a good girl from good family, married. He wanted to teach her. But you know, the lust in man, or in, even in a boy, he was very jealous of. He wanted to have more time with her. Now that Gandhi with that life. He loved to read the books. Also, he got advice from somebody. Also, he saw, he went to the college even, 
did not do much. Uh, this is not for me. But he got advice from the family friend. You go to London, become a barrister, and you would have great life. Somehow, to prove the point, this got in his mind, I want to go to London. Family was against, in a foreign land, sending a 17-year-old kid. Parents were against it. Mother was against it. But he said he was firm. His brother, older brother, encouraged him. He said, I'm ready to pay the money and everything. But mother said, I cannot let you go. Now mother <coughs> understood. They loved each other. He says, yes, I will let you go if you can promise me that you will not eat meat, you will not touch liquor, and you will not touch women. Three vows. And mother believed, mother was very religious. You know, this Gandhiji writes in his autobiography that we used to make fun of her because she will not eat until sun comes up in the you know, sky. So when in rainy season or so the sun is not there, she would stay hungry for you know, a while. <coughs> and then these kids used to make fun. And sometimes sun goes away, then she would not eat. But anyway, those, what mother went through the religious practices of fasting, ingrained in this child's mind, which we will see in the future, how our, our childhood values of her parents ingrained in her comes back. His determination to go to London. In India in those times caste system was very predominant. And many families, if you go out sea, away from India, you are outcast. Caste people outcasted him. But he was determined for his goal, that I want to go and learn. He went there in London, he had so much difficulty, vegetarian food. Can you imagine vegetarian food in the late 80s? Even when we came here in this country in the 60s, we had a problem, you know, finding the vegetarian food. I still food. have that problem in my building. <laughs> but he had given the vows to her mother, promised to her mother, won't touch the meat. He did not know the values of vegetarian food and so forth yet. To get the vegetarian food, he walked 10 miles. Just imagine, in that London, 10 miles he walked to get the vegetarian food. He picked up the book on vegetarianism. He realized the value of the vegetarian food. Not only that, he read books. He learned how to cook vegetarian food. Not only that, once he was convinced, he became a secretary of the vegetarian society in London. We are talking 1880s time period. One advantage is we all can legacy. If you keep a good company of the people, it can affect you. With vegetarian society, he became a secretary. He came in contact with the people in London. At that time, they were, they were all called eccentric in London. But they were, they were intelligent people in London, upper echelon. They were vegetarian, progressive mind. He met any Besant, Madame Velasquez, and any Besant and Velasquez had the Theosophical Society. That's where he learned about Hinduism. He got the English translation of Gita, and he read about it. He also got the Bible, he read about it. At that age, his law school was going on. He went to law school and so on and so forth. In two years, he got the law degree. As soon as he got the law degree, he left next day for India. But in London, what he received, the lessons were stayed with him last, all the life, all the lifetime. One was the simplicity. 
he realized that he was spending the money of his brother who was sending him the money. I cannot. And another thing, Gandhiji at that time, he wanted to be Western. He loved the Western clothes. He wanted to be with them, just like them. Other than the eating food or alcohol, he just wanted to be like them. He learned even violin, tried to learn the violin, because he just wanted to be like them. But he read a lot of books, he came in contact with people, came in England, India, did not have much scope for the job, because still all time, whom you know, that kind of attitude. So he got a, nature, a call, his brother got a call that in South Africa there was an opening. He went to South Africa alone. And his test was there. And if you can say, his transformation of life changed at one incident. He was traveling for the case from uh, Pretoria or Natal to Pretoria. And his uh, uh, set, or you can say his employer, had bought the first class ticket in the train. He was in English clothes and so on and so forth, and he was going to go fight the case. One white person passed by and he saw this brown man sitting in a first class. He complained to the railway person. Railway person came and said, Gandhi, you cannot, Gandhi, you cannot. He argued very well. Next station came, police came. He was forced out in that cold night. Just imagine, person, barrister coming back from London, knowing the, all the value of the you know, British Western looks, democratic system, and here he comes in South Africa, he even bought the right ticket, he's thrown out in the cold, nobody listening to him. At that night in that cold shivering, he, and indirectly you can say meditation, he says, He's not mad at the person who did this thing. He's mad at the deceit of discrimination. Discrimination of the color. He says, he made the determination that I want to eliminate this discrimination or deceit or cancer at that time. And then many things happened, many things happened in uh, South Africa where he united the Indian community, trans, you know, Indian immigrant communities over there, to fight against the justice. Justice with not with the violence or with arms, but the insistent disobedience. He also helped. It's an interesting thing about Gandhi's personality. He's a, such a complex person. He's such a loving person. British and Jew was fighting the war. He says, it's my duty to help them, Zulu people, which is the tribesmen people, Zulu people. British did not like that. You can't help the enemy. We said, well, at least we will, will let you not to fight, but we will help you to stretch an ambulance corpse to treat the wounded people. And he prepared the Indians to take care of the service of these people. So his service and love for humanity developed right from South Africa. Many things did in the, uh, over there. Then he organized, they were going to, again you compare this, what he went to the struggle, like that people are going in the world through the struggle. Many people have gotten the method how to fight against the evil force by non-violence, by organizing campaigns, and so on and so forth. So, and even that one he prepared. One other thing, you know, India, India may have casteism there at that time, but he united everyone, Indians, Muslim, Parsis, uh, Hindus, uh, and even Christians. He united them together to fight against the injustice and equality. He thought the human being, we are all same. We have to fight with the force. So his story, he learned not only that, he had a tremendous impact of the books. Books was, uh, one was from Tolstoy, one was from Ruskin, 
And another one of advice from Srimad Rajchandra. He says, though three people have done tremendous work in my life to change it. The Tolstoy book was, the God is within you. You. You can do with the love, you change the transformation. <coughs> so that's where he got the idea to unite the people again. Ruskin's in the death that you should be self-sufficient. So in, in, uh, uh, in South Africa, he had those farms, Phoenix farm, Tolstoy farm, where self-sufficiency, he ran the printing press. One thing we had to learn from him, he was a tremendous writer. Writer means he used to write the complaints to the newspaper. Any injustice, any inequality, he would write to the newspaper, not only in, uh, in South Africa or Natal or Pretoria or Johannesburg, London, India. So he will keep the people informed, the activism. So I think that uh, legacy of his is as useful can be today in our world here. So when I describe his life, I'm going to try to see what we can use his message or activism even in today's life. And many people have used his activism. Let me say, South Africa, uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, after many years, in 1952, he used that technique of the movement. Also, Martin Luther King, here in this country, used the non-violence, non-obedience, non-cooperation, marching uh, of that. Even in 1955, Rosa Parks in Selma, Alabama, marched. So his methods, whatever he employed, either in South Africa or India, had become the worldwide phenomenon. So let me, as long as I am on that subject, in the Poland, Lee Waleska, also for the worker strike, again by non-violent means. Caesar Chavez in this country, again how non-cooperation movement can work. Also civil rights movement, women rights, if you look at in this country, after inauguration this uh, year I think, yes, no, 2017. Second day women's march in Washington, D.C. It was a tremendous example if you look back the years past in India or something, when how, when you have the just cause, how you can move the people and unite the people for justice and equality. And those legacy are remaining and will remain all around the world. Uh, even in the Philippines, uh, uh, Benico Aquino also did that. So, whatever he did, the world is doing it again and again and again. Gandhi's, or Gandhi's philosophy and message is needed more now than even before when he went through the life struggle in India and so on and so forth. Today, his legacy of nonviolence, getting justice and equality through nonviolence means is spreading all around the world. And the world is really uh, uh, grateful for this new vision that you do not, in order to achieve the results, you don't need the violence of arms, you need nonviolence, you need the love, you need the truth, you need the cause, and you got to unite. Uh, so that's also. So South Africa, he got success, came to India. In Indian politics, he was completely new. Lokmanya Tilak was in a, in a way his mentor. What did he do? He traveled, he said, don't get into politics right away. Learn India, where masses of people live. Know India, what conditions are. At that time, Indian Congress was there. And Indian Congress was uh, all British written lawyers and all they did is send the applications and uh, so on and so forth to the British people, uh, British government. They didn't get any action. The masses and villages. So he traveled and trained by third class, people class. Because he wanted to be with the people. 
In South Africa, he had left all his wealth for the public cause. He only wear two clothes, simple clothes. So South Africa, his lessons, he carried it in, uh, in India. He traveled all around India. You know, one thing, whenever he, he was very straightforward. If he sees something wrong, he will speak up. So he went to Benares as soon as he came over there. Benares, and he saw the filth in the river. He got a same cleanliness. So cleanliness, which he has started even in South Africa, he says, my God, in my country, people do not respect the cleanliness. So he had a cleanliness. So, so he was a social reformer also. He says, wrong habits, wrong rituals are no place. You should have activism. So he traveled all around. The gain opportunity came in Champaran, Bihar, where landlords, mostly the British landlords, but there were some Indian landlords too, but the British landlords were sucking up the laborers and farmers with the indigo crop and everything. Some people say, let's go lawsuit. He said, forget about the lawsuit. Years will pass by, nothing will you know, come out of that thing. He started the campaign going village to village and he volunteers he came to his help and he fought against them they won the case even the british judges he said we have to go he was so straight that i am breaking your law you can do any punishment you want to give me in your power but i am fighting against the unjust law you change the laws or I will fight on. So even judges, British judges, when they were uh, sentencing him, they were indirectly were sorry that if I had a power, I am the first one to let you go. So he was so straightforward because that was his principle of Satyagraha or disobedience movement. It should be open, simple, should be warning to the people in advance that what I am going to do, the accent. It's nothing in the secret that you do the secretly the uh, attack. He was very open. So these kind of a movements also he went to Kerala district in Gujarat again the farmers again the government's unjust laws, taxes, so and so forth. They won. So he got the kind of assurance that whatever he has started in South Africa is also working in India at that time against the British power. Then in the Bardoli area, but the biggest test came in 1930. So we are talking about 1915 he came, 1930. Now let's talk here, 1915, first time when he came, he went to Tagore, Ravindranath Tagore, Nobel laureate Tagore in Calcutta, in a place. And Tagore was so much impressed. So he gave the name Mahatma, which is now known universally. Mahatma means, Maha means great and Atma means soul. Great soul. So original name, his name is Mohandas. Mohandas. So from Mohan he became Mahatma. So he did not mind the Mahatma, but he did not want people to worship him. People in you know, a throngs of villages, people would come and, you know, uh, touch his feet and everything. He says, look at my life, whatever I am doing, be part of it. He may coin the word, change, you want the change, change in the world, change in the condition, you be the change. This is a very, very famous word. If you want to change something, first you change yourself and then you move on. So. The first test, the biggest test where he got the world-renowned uh, exposure to his Satyagraha, his non-violence movement, called Salt March. In 1930, from Ahmedabad, he started Salt March 240 miles away and uh, see. What is Salt March? 
He was looking for the cause to wake up the masses of Indians. Masses of Indians were not awake, only the few educated people were fighting against the British. Most of the people have accepted the British Raj, never bothered to. But in 1930 this opportunity came, he found that how can he have the mass movement of the people. The tax, British people were taxing the salt, which is a natural for anybody's food, but they will tax it. Many of the people, Western people who wrote in that the tax march and whatever happened into the salt march is equal to the Boston Tea Party in the U.S. So 240 miles started with about 9 or 10 people walking by foot, every day walking 10 to 15 miles. With seven people, this news went all around the world, all around the country. People started joining him in the march. And the rules were clear that we are not going to fight no matter what problems come, what the difficulty comes, we are going to suffer. The consequences we are breaking the unjust law, the tax law. They reached by 240 miles drive or about 20 days, 20 days they went. But in that time they had woken up the whole country so everybody was ready and everybody came and they wanted to create the assault, break the law. But at the same time ready. We would say, you know, breaking the law is a punishment. Yes, we are ready to take the punishment because it's an unjust law. British tried, British put them all in the jail and everything, but finally... Leave them up with the luckies. Yes. Uh, that was... I would come back to that, yeah. So, with that march he reached, he did that all. But then there was another project called Dharasana. The salt factory was there. And then... Throngs of people went there because they were all in jail. All these Congress people, uh, National Congress people, Gandhi, they were all in jail because the British had put them in the jail. But the countries had woken up. Country was angry. They do something peacefully. Now, people in the white clothes, women, men, everybody went to the Dharasana and then British had the police, Indian police, but they were under the British. They will go and open the doors, they will not open the doors, they will, and then they are lati, you know, stick. Lati charge. Lati charge. So they will hit them. People will fall down, people will get hurt, nobody will resist. Once their path is clear, another group of the people will come. This went on and on and on, and this was by eyesight, the American newspaper men had a pictures and a story. And that story went all around the world. And that movement made the people aware, 1930. But prior to that, Gandhi loved British people. Even he was very uh, fond of the British Raj and rules and everything. He said, I am a subject of the British Raj. So in 1914, World War I, when he helped them. So you have to fight against the evil. He helped them. And he had a hope that with our action, the British would grant the India home rule or home uh, freedom. No. The Prime Minister at that time had promised. That yes. But in 1918, when the world was over, nothing happened. Not only that, the British with the Rollout Act came out and said no meetings no group meetings, so and so forth, and they started putting everybody in the jail. They came with a big force to fight it. And the worst thing happened in Jallianwala Bagh in 1919, when Dyer, with the innocent people in the garden, opened fire without no defense. 435 people died with thousand shots from this gentleman. I won't say gentlemen, but this, this general. And that was the last line, he says, no, I don't like British government, British Raj. I have no problem with the British people, but I am going to fight against British. 
So the 1919, he made the decision. Then also he said, what are the problems? Why this British people, with 100,000 people only, were ruling millions of Indians? Why? Because they were taking the raw materials from India in their industrial revolution mills and textile mills. They were producing the finished goods and shipping back and getting the higher prices. And they were taking the wealth away from India. So he told the people, let's have our own things. So they burned all the foreign goods, textile mills suffered in England, but it united. Then he also told people that you quit the jobs and fight against the freedom. So the many of the people quit their positions. Many lawyers gave up and they made the cause for the public service. So with all these events, 1930 with them, but still British were not munching. There was a round table conferences uh, in London, but no avail. British were keep kind of a, trying to divide the people of India and then rule as much as they can. But he fought against that. He wanted to keep India together as a one unit. It's unfortunate, unfortunate uh, that it did not succeed. And when India got independence, this man, India was celebrating, and Pakistan was celebrating their freedom from the British. But this man, in a quiet corner of his room, with the tears in his eyes, that the mother India was divided, partitioned. Also, he loved all the people, whether Muslim or Hindu, Christian, Sikh, everybody. He wanted to be everybody together. But the extremist in Hindu shot him on that 1948 day. So the, his life story gives us the lessons of nonviolence, fighting against the injustice which is going on. And he has a definite idea about uh, many things. So I will read some of the things because it's better what he said and you listen to it rather than I said it. On Ahinsa and nonviolence, he said, I see neither bravery nor sacrifice in destroying life or property for offense or defense. Truth implies love, firmness or augurs, born of truth and love or nonviolence. Truth, you know, we had a word nonviolence in thought, speech, and accent. But he added a word truth in thought, truth in speech, truth in accent. So whatever he said was, is a combined of that. Disobedience movement, he said about them. He had a very clear idea. Disobedience to be civil has to be open and nonviolent. Implies discipline. People who had this discipline, thought, and care and attention. Nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. It is mightiest and the mightiest weapons of dis destruction devised by the ingenuity of the man. He said the, the nonviolence weapon has not been tried out by the world and it can bring the good result. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of courage. Also, he did not like intolerance because most of the time violence is created by the intolerance, whether it's a religious, whether it's a community, or whether one country, colonialism, so intolerance. Mm -hmm. So intolerance is in itself a form of violence, an obstacle to me, the growth of a true democratic spirit. However much I may sympathize with and admire worthy motives, I am uncompromising opponent of violent methods even to serve the noblest causes. I believe in the fundamental truth of all great religions of the world. So he was so tolerant about. Now, he had a biggest impact on Indian social issues. In India, we, casteism had an untouchable people. And he made that they are the children of God. He gave them the name Harijan, not untouchables, Harijan. 
he had also the cleanliness issue against India. Also, he helped to clean the villages and clean. In America, when I was a kid, I had gone in the streets of village to clean the streets. But again, see, the problem is when the man was there, everything was happening. Then our Indians forgot about it. So now this new Prime Minister Modi has come up with the cleanliness issue and again he's trying that, reviving that issue. The so, so, social issues, <coughs> again, you know, we had the women. All around the world, women have, have been treated very badly. And he was the champion of the women causes. So in his says, it's very important what he says, to call women the weaker sex is a libel. It is men's injustice to women. Now this is not typical to India all around the world. And even today women are facing in, in, inequality. He says, no, it's not a weaker sex, you know. So next statement. Woman is the companion of men, gifted with equal mental capacities. She has the right to participate in the minutest details of the activities of men and she has an equal right of freedom and liberty with him. So he had a definite idea in women, uh, talking about the untouched, about untouchables. So also he suffered with his promises. So when he made the ashram in Ahmedabad, you know, just like what he did in Phoenix in South Africa or Tolstoy in Phoenix Farm, he did a Samarbati River ashram. He says he should have everyone, including untouchables. Just think about it. Even his wife did not approve that. No, no, no. Untouchables cannot be in the ashram. Many people oppose. The people who had helped, mostly the textile owners, rich people had helped to run the ashram, they withdrew their support. But he was he was able to convince the ashram people that they are the people just like we are. That's not their fault to be to born in that caste or whatever. You cannot be judged by the caste. And he called them children of God, Harijan. And he fought for that uh, issue. So with all this opposition, but then one night, one textile owner dropped all the money to his ashram. And that textile man, sister, was with Gandhi and she was supporting him all the way. So he had gone through a lot of difficulty but then he had found a way to do the things. Again, his firm determination to fight with love and all that. So, Again, he has a democracy. Look at the democracy view. We call it the Western world, democracy and everything. What definition of democracy he means is the art and science of mobilizing the entire physical, economic and spiritual resources of all the various sections of the society in the service of the common good of all. Again, look at the equality, look at his justice. For the children, he loved the children. And all his uh, travels, and even when he was old. If we are to reach real peace in this world, and if we are to carry on a real war against war, we shall have to begin with children. He saw the benefit, the children, because they are going to be tomorrow's citizens. If we start the children teaching them the peace and love and non-violence and justice and equality, when they grow up, they will act uh, accordingly. Even, it's interesting, Gandhi was so direct. When he went to London, he had this two-piece dhoti. When he went to London, people said this fakir, this naked man had come to India. They wanted to stay in the hotel. He said, no, no, I'm not going to stay in the hotel. He was a simple man. I'm going to stay with the people. He stayed with the textile workers in London. 
Then he used to walk on the street. Children used to come, Gandhi, Gandhi, where is your uh, trousers? He used to laugh. He used to have fun with the kids. So he was such a, such a political, even the politician, even the big man, he was along with the children, along with the textile mill worker. Those who were affected by, by the uh, unemployment due to the Swadeshi movement in India, they all loved him, the common man. When he went to see the queen and king, he did not wear western clothes. Many people advised him to western clothes, no. I'm going to wear whatever I have, which he did. So look at this power of his own soul. That whatever he believed in, he just stayed with that. So, humility. You know, I think that's the one legacy we as an individual, we had to carry that then. And then also he says, he never claimed he's a superman. He has done tremendous work. Nobody else can do it. No. I claim to be no more than the average man with less than average ability. I am not a visionary. I claim to be a practical idealist, practical idealist. Nor can I claim any special merit for what I have been able to achieve with the laborer's research. He doesn't claim. I have not the shadow of doubt that any man or woman can achieve what I have if he or she could make the same effort and cultivate the same hope and faith. So he believed in every soul that you are capable of doing it. His life was an open book, so much that he said, my life is my message. He exhibited extreme humility, simplicity, service to humanity, and hard work in his conduct and lifestyle. So this is his humility. Now, legacy we already said is non-violence, truth, activism, not passivism, that you got to fight for that. And in closing, I would say, because I want to open up for a question and answer, because I know many of you have read about him, many of you have experienced or seen him live when he was alive. So I want to give the time to you to share your feeling, comments, or questions. And also you can say how we can use his legacy or philosophy in today's world. Because the world is moving, circumstances are moving, conditions are moving. Whatever condition, whatever thing he did in South Africa or India are applicable all around the world which we saw uh, he was able to do. So his legacy this is, I, I picked up from the Louis Fisher book on Gandhi, and I thought this would be a good closing uh, for me. His legacy was courage, and we saw his courage all over, all the incident. His lesson was truth. His weapon was ahimsa and love. His life was <coughs> nonviolent, and he belongs to mankind. He was not just for India. He is for the man mankind. And mankind can use his legacy to practice the peace. Peace will come if we can have the tolerance, respect for each other, because nothing is absolute. We all have our opinions. If we can talk and understand each other with a peaceful means, uh, we can have, we can uh, achieve so many things. Again, uh, his message of freedom, equality, and justice will ring 
for years to come. Because that's the only weapon with satyagraha, non-violence and love, the world has to experience to uh, avoid the armaments or avoid the Armageddon uh, in the future. So at this time, uh, thank you uh, very much. And at this time, I will open up for questions, comments, uh, sharing your experience. Uh, Dr. Saxena. I have a couple of comments. Uh, first of all, you gave a very beautiful description of his life and, and what he achieved and his message to the world, which is, which is uh, immortal. I mean, and that is for, for future as well as the past. But he, first, first comment, that he was a very shrewd, intelligent politician. Now, think, think about India at that time. It was poor, but the masses were in the villages. At that time, 80 to 90, 80 to 85 percent people lived in villages. So what did he do? Honey. So he burned the you know clothes that come from in England or uh, you know uh, Europe, and we are khadi, which every village had. He went against the the uh, you know not against sorry he he hurried them. So, so mix them because they were the large majority in the village. Children, you, you pointed out. Women, you pointed out that because half the women, half the country is women. But he brought one other thing, and that is religion, because he knew that that in the village, particularly the women, were very religious. So he brought it is every you know uh, meeting, big meeting. So he combined improvement of the social system, improvement of, of uh, I mean religion, education, so, so that the whole mass of India was with him. Yes. And in that sense, in fact, I remember a comment made by, by Sarojini Naidu, you can't imagine how much money we had to spend to keep him poor. <laughs> <laughs> so they, this was a politics. Yeah. It was not that he was, you know, they, they kept him in the, so do you know when he traveled in the third class, there was not a crowd of thousands of people in that third class, there were two people or, four or five people, okay. So how much money we spent to keep him poor. But he was a tremendous politician and, and uh, obviously like any human being, he was a human being, he was not God, he was not super uh, He made the mistake, but he, also achieved tremendous amount. Otherwise, it would not have been uh, possible to have independence. Yes. And Churchill, of course, by that time he was prime minister in 1944-45. And Churchill said, "On my dead body, yes. free, freedom to India on my dead body." So all the previous, uh, you know, promises to India were gone mm -hmm. in a moment. And he said, "You know, I will not give freedom to India." So. That's but, that's but, yeah. Uh, as an aside, that I am not even sure that this is a comment that is appropriate for today, but I am going to make it all the same. History, if you read as much, 10,000 years. History, particularly in the last 2,000 years, has shown us that wherever a country is a strong military, they will. Wherever country is weak militarily and economically, they get defeated. And I think India is, a, up until the time of Ashok, India was very powerful. Its influence was all over the world. Its business was with all, you know, at least the Mediterranean and, and Europe, as, as well as with China um, and the uh, Southeast Asia. Once he became a Buddhist and non-violent, after that war in Andhra Pradesh. At that time, Andhra Pradesh was not Andhra Pradesh. Orissa. Orissa. Orissa was Kalinga at that time. Kalinga, yeah. And after that, you see the, the Mohammedans came. They lived from 11th century to the 16th century. Then the British came. They ruled over us for 400 years. 
But you can take the example of take the example of Chagas Khan. He conquered half the world. His his emperor, his empire was biggest ever in his known history. How did he do that? Arms. Look at the uh, what Romans did. They controlled the world. And then how was Christianity defeated by the Moors, by the Muslims, by arms? And then what was the the you know church organized in France and church in Spain? They organized the attacks on the Moors and they defeated them. So arms have been. Look at the German war. I mean Germany conquered a large part of Europe, and then how was it? Was the Hitler defeated by American <coughs> arms and British arms. So arms have been extremely important and you cannot have a big army unless you have good economics. So ultimately <coughs> economics and military force is dominant and that is the historical example to us for at least the last five thousand. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not uh, no, I, w I won't comment. I think uh, still what he says, non-violence, uh, uh, non-violence weapon has not been tried out by the world fully yet. Yes, this is a past history. I agree with that. But the non-violence has not been tried. If we want the peace in our co just forget about the country fighting the war. But if you want the peace in the community, that's the only means. The non-violence means love the community. Any more comments? Yes. <coughs> uh, I don't have a comment, but this talk, this day, evoked all my memories. I grew up and went to a school which was very patriotic. We wore khadar for three years. Khadi. Khadi. Khadi Homespun clothing. Yeah, yeah. Homespun, yeah, for three years. We used to go to Birla House when Gandhiji was there and sing all these things you know, and hear him. I was, you know, in eighth, eighth grade, ninth grade, something like that. So I didn't hear much about the philosophy and other things. I was so involved, involved in singing and all that, you know, yeah, yeah. the kids' things. Then uh, in Pune, when he was in the jail, and I forget the name of the jail. Yeah, Erwada or Khan, Aga Khan, yeah. My, my family, we went to see him and a couple of times were there. And uh, then we came to, I came to Delhi and with all the schooling and all that. And it was very patriotic. We had Sir Gandhiji's, I mean, all this singing and prakna, all these things. And every time on January, uh, February, uh, October 2nd, mm -hmm. and then later on, on uh, January 30th. Yeah. I went when his shop was being taken. Oh, yeah. yeah, up to the Rajkhat. We walked oh, from Daryaganj to that place. And uh, all those memories. Oh, God. Well, of course, many of you have seen the Gandhi movie. I think it's a four hour I've long movie. It, but I've seen which, no, no, you have, you, you have seen it, which is very, very fortunate. Yeah. But what my point is, all these things is uh, yeah. when you have experienced real yourself. And also, uh, Dr. Saxena has uh, experienced. In 1948, when his ashes were being, you know, uh, put in the river, uh, the I was there, and there were millions of people, and all the leaders of India were on elephants in the houses, and Swarashmi sang this song that Kusum sang, Kusum and Nanaji, uh, and she was singing, you know, from one of the houses uh, on the elephant. And I was there. I mean, it was, and everything seemed to be dark. I mean, when we died, people talk about Kennedy's death here. Yeah. But I felt that, and I was only 17 years old. I felt that as if the light has gone out of oh. the body uh, and of the yeah. earth. And yes. Any more, uh, Nana? Yeah. <laughs> Just, um, it's so ironic that man of such peace and nonviolence died of a great act of violence. And, you know, when you say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And he lived with only peace and ahimsa. Mm -hmm. And yet, violence is always that one um, thing that... It's, it's a tragedy of the human nature. Right. In a way, you can say tragedy of the human nature. Yeah. 
uh, President Obama said rightfully that we cannot change the human nature, but we can change the human circumstances or conditions in this country. Yeah. President, also, President Obama, it's very interesting how Gandhiji have affected the many, many top people. You know, he has been written so much about his philosophy of non violence and so forth. So all this writing, when you read that, these great people, uh, particularly President Obama, he was asked in high school that if you have a, suppose somehow you have given the freedom to do something, what would you do? He said, I have one wish. I have one wish that if I have a chance to have a lunch or dinner with Mahatma Gandhi, <laughs> just, just think about it that this man who, you know, who was president for eight years uh, in this country, in one of the school he said, he, he has so much impression about him. Even uh, our late John uh, McKay from Arizona, Senator, he said, Gandhi he is a man of peace. He cannot do anything wrong. The world is safer with him. So the many people have so many. And you said main nature about it. Look at Martin Luther King. Became a bullet. Abraham Lincoln. Huh? For that matter, even Jesus. Even Jesus was trying. See, the power and the greed. That is even worse than anything else. Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And, and Gandhiji loved very much Jesus' message of love. You know, in the last time, just think about the power of forgiveness. In his last day, God forgive them, they do not know what they are doing. Just just message, you know, for the same way Gandhiji was there. He never hated people who did not agree with him. He says it. And Ram, just to complete. I just really wish at some point that even posthumously he would be given the Peace Prize. Look at all the people yeah. that listen to his movements, like Martin Luther King, so many others who have received the Peace Prize, no yeah. Nobel Prize. Uh, let me give you something here. Uh, uh, yeah, right. I, yeah. But it was considered by Nobel Peace Prize in 1947 for 48. But he became the victim of the bullet in 1948 January. But then they said that uh, indirectly the peace over was given to uh, what's his name? Uh, Tutu of South Africa also kind of peace. Nelson Mandela some of the peace. Dalai Lama. So I, I think uh, no, no, I, I agree. We, we as a people. You should be given now. But, uh, yes, that's a name, you're right, name. But what memorials he has around the world other than Nobel Peace Prize? If you look at many places, there are peace institutes and peace workshops and so on and so forth. Any place you read, if comes to peace question, Mahatma Gandhi's name is there. Satyagraha. I mean, that's the coin word. Satyagraha was not a word before in the dictionary. But his biggest weapon, Gandhiji's biggest weapon, was fasting. Whenever he oh, yeah. went on a fast, in the jail or outside the jail, after a few days, the world was at his feet. Because <laughs> world, world connected heart to no, heart. To heart. That's what he said. That was his biggest weapon. But the good thing after Gandhi, I am born um, much after that. Uh, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> but anyways, um, the era I grew up in, in those days, Gandhi's name was everywhere. Schools. We used to do the. I lived with that. I yeah. We, we had well, there, is no, there is no doubt about it. That's why we call him father, Nason's father, father of the nation. Uh, yes, Gita, I know you're raising hand. Okay. Can you speak a little louder? Because then. Oh. No, you refer to that. Arms have played a big role, right? But what you said is that really is a short-term goal that it has achieved. 
right power. But in the long run, something that works is my violence. Peaceful methods of because you know we have there's no way we can have ever fought the Britisher in <coughs> arms. There's no way. Even right now, people don't I mean look Hitler for all he wanted to do. He still got you know defeated. Okay? So evil never works. Because that the weapon to use evil is arms. And uh, yes, like a Bhagavad Gita says, right? And Krishna explained to Arjuna why he had to bear arms and fight for that, right? But unless there's a just cause, there are two ways you can fight with a just cause. Maybe using weapons. But I, this is my view, I think it's only non-violence. Love and truth really outlast right. You know, to add to what Gitaji is saying, look at it in a different way. Let's take all the countries which got independence from 1940 to 1970 and compare those countries today and how they are being governed. No one can match India in many, many ways. In fact, many of them who got their independence through violence, now they are suffering through it. You know, all countries in South Africa, there is no peace, right? There is always issues. And India being with so much diversity, there is no one unifying threat, right? Just because we became pacifists, I believe India is still surviving as a nation. Okay? If we start fighting within India, it will become 40 pieces, not one piece. Okay? Think about what kind of things we could do with all 40 pieces together. That's why still we are able to control a good amount of things. right? But if we start moving towards violence, I worry about will India become 40 pieces. Let me bring another issue about uh, Mahatma Gandhi, which I didn't mention. He was a conservationist, ecologist. He believed in simple life, not to use much, to save the resources. Even in a book by, written by Vice President Gore about uh, conservation and ecology, he mentions about Gandhiji. Gandhiji's one British uh, author has written a book, Small is Beautiful. I think we got to think, uh, peace is of course the issue, but we got to think about the issue of this ecology, conservation, reduction of usage of the world resources because this uh, climate, climate change and the temperature, we are going to have not only war, but they are going to destroy these things, not to the one nation, the entire world. So I think his message of simplicity, also growing up the farm and living a simple life, doing the work, labor and everything, his message should ring to the people of the world that we do not waste the resources of this world. We realize that it, we have to save. Another thing he said, you know, it's, it's, we, we are the guardians, guardians of this earth, environment-wise, air-wise, water-wise, we are the guardians. We got to save this planet, right? Also he talked about the property. He is very specific that we should have this government, democracy, true democracy is when they combine the physical, economic and spiritual resources of every section to make it good for all. And what has happened right now in the world only one percent of the people indirectly controlling all the wealth, right? So I think somewhere on the line, he was transformer of the hearts of the people. So I think we, now coming back to us, what can we learn from his lessons? We may not be able to achieve what he did, but at least as an individual, we have to start with, of course, nonviolence. We can have peaceful forgiveness, to be peaceful. Service to others is a peaceful, right? 
But at the same time, collectively, we should be activism for the justice. If something happening wrong, we should speak up. We should support the means. So that's what he's talking about. He was a great writer. We should be writing if any place injustice is happening. We should be writing about it. Uh, yes, Gita. Things are happening. You know, I've been involved with the innocent kids for the last 20 years. And uh, we are using now they're not throwing kids right away in prison, right? These young youth, even in schools, they're not sending them home because they are a little bit rowdy. It's coming with understanding and love, coming from where they are, that trauma, generational poverty. So now they are bringing in these restorative practices and all these different peaceful and loving type practices to deal with the children and their problems, <clears throat> and uh, we are seeing amazing results. Our new superintendent in St. Paul, he's all for these restorative type practices and uh, working with the trauma. And so I think things are, and it is really cooperation, right, of Mahatma Gandhi's original principles of dealing stuff, you know, coming with love and truth. Uh, th thank you, Gita. I think we got to keep doing, helping the community. Okay, okay. okay. one more. Um, Last one. I just one. wanted to say, you know, um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was a great environmentalist, right? Um, that's yeah. what you were saying. Well, personally, we have to put it in practice, right? Yeah. All of his views being harmonious with nature and yeah. your environment, etc. I just wanted to say, in case anybody doesn't know, that yesterday yes. um, they passed uh, a solar project. So this temple now yeah. will be having solar energy mm -hmm. rather than using the fossil fuels. It's a great, great cause, a great uh, thing, uh, very good. Hindu Mandir is active in conservation, even in the, if you look in the kitchen area, everything that's saving the plates and uh, waste of paper, cardboard, everything. Already they have a solar panel. Uh, also, they have better lighting and all those things. That's great. And I think we, everybody should do individually in their uh, workplace. Yes. Okay. Oh, India is the way ahead in solar energy, wind energy. Yes. Uh, one more, couple more announcements because I think we are time is up because Puja would be there. Uh, on Thursday, October 4, 6 o'clock, Nobel Peace Prize winner Kailash Satyadri would be here at the Hindu Mandir. So please visit, come. Uh, he's a great, uh, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. He, again, he's freeing the children and the women and the girls from the indirectly kind of indenture or slavery and everything. He's doing great work over there. Also, India Association of Minnesota will publicly celebrate on October 7th, Sunday, at Capitol Rotunda, 2 to 4, again, celebration of Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. With that one, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you for your comments and participation. And we wish you the best peace uh, in your life, happiness. Okay. Thank you.